palaces, the poor and unlearned, and the man of degree. They all have a soul in need of salvation, and they all have to come to Calvary. And I am so glad God saves all sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed that he sets them free. But the biggest surprise in redeeming all sinners is that he would say an old sinner like me. Was I so bad that I needed forgiveness? Was I so wrong I had to be redeemed? I wasn't a thief, but I lived in sin's prison, and I was as lost as a sinner could be. And I am so glad God saves all sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed that he sets them free. But the biggest surprise in redeeming all sinners is that he would save an old sinner like me is that he would say an old sinner like me. We are glad to have Brother Donald Wattenbarger as our guest evangelist. Uh, this is his third year. spent a lot of time together uh, last year in the Philippines. We went to the Philippines together on our, our missions trip, and uh, we stayed in the same hotel room, prayed together, uh, saw many people saved, got to preach together, and Brother Donald did not get to go to the Philippines this year. Uh, his father uh, graduated and went to heaven, and so he could not make that trip, and uh, instead I had my wife go with me, and Brother Donald left with a much better heart. I'll tell you that. Amen. Amen. But no, you're a good friend, brother. I'm just so glad she got to go. And uh, I'll tell you, Brother Donald may say some things about his dad. His dad did not, he did not grow up in a saved home, but his dad got saved. Amen. And he uh, came to know the Lord before he, he died and uh, was a great man. And I told our church. dad obviously grew in grace. Amen. And he became a great Christian. And we're so glad to have Brother Donald with us. He's going to preach this morning. He'll be preaching tonight. And let me ask you all to be thinking about something. I don't want your mind wandering during the message. I want you focused on him. But I do want you to put people on your heart. There are people you know and love who are not here this morning. And you probably knowing folk like I know them. A lot of folk don't like to get out of bed early. And uh, you can probably get somebody to come back tonight. And I hope you will. I hope you'll be working on getting some people back tonight for the 6 o'clock service. But we're honored right now. And I hope you'll get your Bibles out and get ready to listen to some preaching. Brother Don Wattenbarger, come preach to us. Let's give him a good Alabama welcome. Amen, brother. Thank you. Our brother from Tennessee. Am I on now? Yes. Praise the Lord. It's good to be on. <laughs> Amen. Well, 
Uh, it is good to be back here with you again. I, so many of you I've thought of, so many of you throughout the year. And uh, some I remember from last year visiting and different things, and you're here today, and we're, we're pleased about that. It's good to be here. Let me say a big thank you to the church for the good accommodations, and uh, we appreciate that. The room just clean as a pen, as always, and uh, so we appreciate you putting us up here, inviting us to come, uh, inviting people to come out to the meetings. Uh, can I say this? Uh, it's not that we want to draw a crowd. It's not that we're looking for a crowd, but we want to, we, we want to do our part to honor God before Jesus comes. Now, let me make a statement. Look here. Next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. Jesus is coming. I heard about somebody put a bumper sticker on their car the other day, and uh, they said, uh, that bumper sticker said, Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. (laughs) Amen. And uh, we're living in the grace dispensation now, and we have the great privilege of bringing people to the house of God and hearing the word of God. And you heard the word of God one time. If you're saved today, you're saved because God gave you his word and planted it in your heart. And when you received it uh, and, and you were willing to believe the word of God above your own feelings, then you trusted God's son as your savior. And if you've done that, we're going to heaven one day. Can somebody say amen? And so uh, we're going to deal today with the subject uh, of issues. And you know, I have issues. I'm not going to tell you mine because I'm afraid you might tell somebody. Amen? My messages a lot of times goes on the internet and go out to different uh, like trucking ministries and things like that. And I don't want you to know all my issues. And I don't want to know all your issues. Amen? But you know, every one of us have areas where we battle. Every one of us have areas where we struggle. Now, if you don't struggle with an area, it's because you must not be trying to grow in the Lord and be near the Son of God. The truth is anybody who really wants to be near God is in the fight of their life. Because the day in which we live now, sin has become a sport. It's like Hollywood wants to see just how far we can go, how far can we press the envelope, what can we do, and what is the next thing on the agenda so that it will make us feel better. They outgrow one thing to go to another, to another, to another. And uh, our society is the same way. But you know what? In the eyes of God, sin is not a sport. Sin is an abomination. In the eyes of God, in the eyes of the creator of our universe, sin is not something to enjoy, but it's something to abhor. In the eyes of God, uh, sin is something that he will deal with in the lake of fire. And so can I say this? You're here today because we believe this blessed old book, the Bible. Can somebody say amen? And uh, I'm going to deal, Lord being our helper, with some issues today. Just some issues. And the title of the message, if you're writing this down, write down, we all have issues. Because the truth is, we do. Preacher was saying just a minute ago that I come from a background of, uh, my dad was an alcoholic. If you've ever been raised in a, around alcoholism or you have family members that were an alcoholic, uh, then I know where you come from. Because uh, my dad turned in the meanest fellow in the whole world when he started drinking. He's the nicest guy in the world whenever he, I mean, he's like Jekyll and Hyde. You didn't know what to expect, you know. One day everything was good and I'd come home and everybody was relatively happy. And then, boy, the next time somebody's mad and throws something at you, amen. And so uh, I know what it is to be on both sides of the track. My dad, though, got gloriously saved and surrendered to the Lord. And I was his pastor for almost 17 years. Now that's good right there, amen. And uh, I, was, I was telling the Sunday school class earlier, I didn't know many messages whenever I first got saved. I knew two. I mean, whenever I first started preaching, I knew two messages. God hates homosexuality, and if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell when you die. <laughs> and I'm telling you, every time somebody came to our church, they got one of those two messages. You know, that's pretty good for a while, but whenever you come Sunday after Sunday, 52 weeks a year, somebody needs to preach maybe something else, Amen. <laughs> But that's all I knew then. And so uh, we've grown in grace and God has helped us. We're going to try to deal with something today that though it is familiar, it will bring back some memories and probably jog your thinking. And hopefully you'll be like myself and you'll say, you know, there's an issue that the Lord could help me with. Because I want to tell you something. In the day in which we live, we've all got 
some issues. Amen. Can I say this, Brother Maddox? Thank you for inviting me back again. And we're going to try, by the help of the Lord, uh, to mind God this week. In fact, the whole week will be a week where we're giving ourselves to this theme. We all have issues. So you're getting the first message, and that'll be the theme throughout the week. And we'll try, by the help of the Lord, to deal with several different issues. Open the Word of God, please, if you will, to the book of Luke. And let's go to Luke chapter number 8. Would you stand with us, please, if you can and will? We're going to go to the 8th chapter of Luke. And we're going to deal with something very familiar. Uh, but at the same time, something that I believe could help us if we will listen to the Lord. I'm going to give you somewhat of an outline of the chapter. In other words, I don't just want to pick something out and preach it like throwing uh, like a shotgun, you know. I don't want to do that, but I want, us, I want us to see that there's a reason that this particular story is in this particular place in the Word of God. And whenever we see that, I think it'll be a little easier to apply. And so I want you to notice what the Bible said, Luke chapter number 8. And I want us to go down uh, to verse number 40. I want us to go down to verse number 40, Luke chapter 8, and we're going to go down to verse number 40. The Bible said it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. Look up and listen close. Look up and listen very close. They gladly received the Lord. In other words, they could find no help for their problem anywhere else. And so they were hungry. You know what? If a person's hungry, you don't have to stand at the table and sing 15 songs of Just As I Am to get them to come and get something to eat. If a person's thirsty, you don't have to go back here to the water fountain and stand at the water fountain and plead with people, please come and get a drink. You know what? Whenever people are hungry and thirsty, they can gladly receive that thing, that only thing that will satisfy. And what we find here in the Word of God is these people needed Jesus. Can somebody say amen? You pre look here, if you'll say amen, I'll preach fast. If you clam up on me and don't say anything, it may take a while to get through this, amen. All right, so now watch, watch what the Bible said. These people needed the Savior. They gladly received Him, for they were all waiting for Him. Now, and behold, there came a man named Jairus. Now this Jairus is special. Look at it close. There came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come unto his house. For he had one only daughter. Can you say those words with me? One only daughter. I want you to notice this about 12 years of age. That's significant. He had one only daughter. She's about 12 years of age. And the Bible said she lay a dying. But as he went, the people throned him. So here you have Jairus. He's saying, Lord, i got to have your help. My only daughter has, uh, that's 12 years old is sick and she needs you. But there were so many people. There was such a crowd throning the Lord Jesus that Jairus couldn't get Jesus' attention away, it seemed, fast enough. Verse number 43, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years. Notice it now. The girl is 12 years old. And the woman has an issue of 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians. Neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stenched. The Bible said in verse number 45, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. And thou sayest, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the, women, when the woman saw that she could not be hid, 
she came trembling and falling down before him and declared unto him before all the people for, that, for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Verse number 48, read it aloud please. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please today give me help from heaven. I ask you that you would open every heart. I ask you, God, that you would help me to give the truth that you have given me and assigned for this particular time and this particular group of people. We ask you, God, that you would not only empower us and use us to be clear, but that you would open the heart of every person here, men, women, boys, and girls, that they might respond to you. And we ask you in Jesus' name for your favor. Amen. You can be seated today. This is seated in the chapter in a particular way. Look at me and listen close. There are different types of people in this room now. There are those of us that are in this room that are revealed in this chapter. I want to show you some of those people. And you see, if like myself, you fall into one of these categories. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, we have a group of people. And they are fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus. In a sweet fellowship, one of those people is Mary Magdalene. Verse number 1 through 3 tells of this woman. And she's fellowshipping with the Lord. A fellowship that is sweet between her and her Lord. Fellowship. Notice what the Bible said, verse number 1. Chapter 8 and verse number 1. And it came to pass that afterward he went throughout this, uh, every city and village. And then look here. He's not staying still. He walked everywhere he went. Notice who's going with him. He is preaching and showing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, but that's not all. Verse number 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities... Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Look up here at me. Here are some people that are following the Savior in this chapter whose lives have been radically and dramatically changed. Can I tell you something? When my dad was in that situation where he was an alcoholic, he was rotten. And I was started out in my life, whenever I started out in life, I started in the same direction, following the same footsteps. And I wasn't as bad maybe as a lot of people were, but I was headed on my way to become an alcoholic. And the dumb things I was doing, anything that felt good is what the way I lived. But I want to tell you something, whenever my dad met Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he was changed that day from that day forward, amen. And you know what happened to his boy? When his boy met Jesus, I would never, ever be able to be the same again. You know why? Because Jesus changes lives. Now, religion can show you how to do better. Religion can tell you how to do better. But an experience with Jesus where Jesus Christ literally invades your life is not just following rules and regulations, but thanks be unto God, it's a fellowship that is life-changing. Can somebody say amen? And so in the first part of the chapter, we have a fellowship that is very, very real. Verse number 5, we have a field. Look at the field in verse number 5. We're going to have to go hurriedly now. Chapter 8 in verse number 5. A sower went forth to sow his seed. And when he sowed, some fell by the wayside. The, here is a field that has a wayside. And in these verses, Jesus deals with the field. Look up at me now. Jesus is revealing the truth about the hearts of mankind. You may not be like Mary, where in you there were seven devils living. You may not have anything in common much with her. 
But you do have something in common with these verses that talks about the hearts of men. And the field is the hearts of mankind. And Jesus said in these verses that some people's heart is like a field that has a wayside. The exterior of the field had an area where they would walk along the side of the field. And where they walked at and where they ran their animals and where the, where, the, uh, where the wagons would be pulled through, over there on that side, when seed hits that ground, it's so hard that it can't get in. In other words, you can take the best seed, the best seed that money can buy, and when you put it in the ground that is so hard, it's been beat down by traffic over it. It's constantly been trampled over. It is so hard. You can put the seed on there, but it won't help anything because seed cannot grow in that environment. There's some of you that may have a heart exactly like that. You may have been in churches you may have been around Christians and you may say, you know what? If that's what Christianity is, I don't want anything to do with it. And I mean, look here, there are bad deacons and there are bad preachers and some of them are not even saved. Some of them don't even know God's Son. But if you'll get your mind off of the deacons and the preachers and the Sunday school teachers and put your mind on Jesus, you can watch Him all day and you won't find any fault with Him. Amen. So listen close. There's something about the field here. He said some people are hearers and it's like putting good seed on hard ground. And then he said in these verses that there's some ground that's stony ground. In other words, it's not just hard, it's really hard. There are some people who hate the things of God. There are some people who say they don't even believe in God. I was talking to a fellow not long back, he said, I'm an atheist. And I said, I don't believe in atheists. <laughs> Can somebody say amen? amen? The Bible said God has delivered to every man the measure of faith. When a person says they're an atheist, they are not saying, I cannot believe. They're saying, I choose not to obey. There's a God in heaven that requires for every man, woman, boy, and girl to submit to his authority. Can somebody say amen? And this man had traveled so far in life that his heart was as hard as a stone. I said, I don't believe in atheists. He said, I bet you, this has been a couple years ago now, he said, I bet you that you think hell is just full of atheists. And I said, I don't believe there's any atheists in hell. Everybody that's ever went to hell is a believer the moment they get there. Can somebody say amen? The moment they get in the fire, they're no longer saying I'm an atheist. Matter of fact, people that are burning in hell today are more eager to get their family saved than many of us that are sitting on Baptist church pews. The rich man lifted his eyes and he said, send somebody, send somebody to my five brethren. And he's weeping while he's in hell. Can I say this? Some people have a heart that's as hard as stone. And you can put the seed of the word of God on it and it really doesn't help anything. It really doesn't ever seem to come up. Jesus said some people have thorny ground hearts. And it's like they're, you put the seed in their life, but then the thorns of the world choke it down. And the world may have your heart right now. And God may be wanting to do something in your life, but the world's got a hold of you. And it's like it chokes the life out of you. Can I say this? There's a better way. There's a better way. He said some seed, though, fell on good ground. You're looking at a good ground here, right here. I remember the day that the sweet Holy Spirit of God pricked my heart, broke up my fallow ground, and helped my old hard heart to become soft enough that the Word of God can get in. And can I say this? I don't regret it, amen. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad God has sent His Son to be my Redeemer, and I'm glad to obey His authority. Amen. Buddy, I want to tell you, it's not cussing and swearing at my house. <clears throat> it's praising and glory to God, and hallelujah. Sometimes we get around the eating table, and we'll pray over a meal, and somebody will get happy in the Lord. And I want to tell you something, that's the way it ought to be, amen. All right. Then we have, we have a field, we have a fire. Jesus talks about, in verse number 16, the fire that should be in everybody's life. Look up here and listen close. He, he said, 
when a candle is lit, it's not supposed to have a bushel cover it up. The fire. Somebody is revealed in this chapter. Then there's a shocking revelation about the family of the Lord Jesus in verse 19. Jesus' mother comes while he's preaching a meeting. And she begins to say something along this line. Tell him to come out here. I want to talk to him. His mama's saying, come out here now, boy. I want to talk to you. Then Jesus straightens that whole situation out and corrects her and said that his mother and his brethren are the ones that do the will of God. In other words, religion says, God, we're going to make a puppet out of your son Jesus and we're going to make money. Religion says we're going to make money off of Jesus and that's similar to what the mother was doing. Jesus has to obey her. But in reality, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Can somebody say amen? And one day, every person will stand before him in judgment. He rebukes his own mother. And he helps her. Because she's a sinner just like you and I are a sinner. Immaculate conception, by the way, deals more with the glorious woman that has the child than it does the child. But that's exactly backwards. She was a sinner just like all of us are sinners. And she had to have her own son to become her savior just like you and I have to have a savior. But thanks be unto God, the attention is not on the child. I mean on the mother, but on the child. Amen. All right, let's go on. Then we have not only a family situation, but a fearing situation. Verse number 22, the disciples get in the midst of a storm. You may be here today and you may be in the midst of a storm. Your issue may be a storm issue. Your life may be coming apart. Your marriage may be coming apart. Your children may be coming apart. You may be coming apart. You may be in the midst of a bad storm. Can I say this? We all have issues. Jesus understands your issue. Then we have a failure in verse 27 through 37. I won't explain all of it, but it's very good study. Jesus comes to the land of the Gadarenes, and while in the land of the Gadarenes, the people have a demonic man at their graveyard. And the demonic man is cutting himself, and he's a lunatic. Well, the place is a place that was settled by Jewish people. Long story short, the Gadarenes are a part of the tribe of Gad. And they did not go on into the Canaan land and dwell in the Canaan land like God had commanded them to do so. They came back and developed the land of the Gadarenes and their children didn't know anything about God, anything about Jesus. And as a result, when Jesus came to their coast, and healed the demonic man, they wanted to run him out of town. Somebody's heart falls into every single one of these places and people that are revealed in the 8th chapter of Luke. It could be that you are the person with an area of a field that needs to be corrected. It could be that you're a person with a family situation that needs to be corrected. It may be that you're in a storm and you're going through a time of fear and your issue may be that of fear and it needs to be corrected. But I'll promise you this, we've all got issues and Jesus can help you with your issue. All right, now let's look at this woman. Let's look at this woman. Verse number 40 again. Let's look at it. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, no, 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 excuse me, verse number 43. I'm in the wrong chapter. There ain't no wonder that didn't look right. Amen? Verse number 40, verse number 40. It came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. For 
They were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue and fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come unto his house. Verse number 42 reveals Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. There's a man with some issues. And then there's a woman in the chapter that has an issue of blood. And that issue of blood is causing her to bleed to death. And for 12 years, she's dealt with that. So here's what I see as we look at these issues. Two very opposite people. Two polar opposite people. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. Very rich, very popular. Everybody knows his name. You have him, he has a 12-year-old daughter, and she's dying. Then you have this woman, she's not rich. You know, did you ever notice that they don't even tell us her name? It doesn't even reveal what the woman's name is. She's not rich, she's not popular, she's not even loved. Jairus would have been somebody that would have been very beloved. He would have been somebody that all the townspeople would have said, this man's Jairus. He's a good man. Everybody knows him. Again, two polar opposites. This woman, though, was a woman with an issue that nobody wanted to even be around her. Did you realize that this woman with the issue of blood was in such a situation the woman with the issue of blood, that she couldn't even go to church. She couldn't even be in the house of God. She was separated from friends and family and even fellowship with God. Listen to me closely. Both of these people had an issue. Both of these people needed Jesus. Both of these people are at the total two ends of the spectrum Totally different people, but thanks to being the God, they didn't, look here, they didn't get turned away when the Lord Jesus came. He had the answer for all of the issues. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know your family situation, and you don't know mine. And you don't know the areas in my life that I have battled with. But I'll tell you this, I have found that Jesus is still the answer. And so, we have two polar opposites. The Bible said, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Let me take just a second here and say, You know, sometimes preachers don't care. Your preacher does, but you may not be from this church. Sometimes church members don't care. The world certainly don't care. Did you realize there's a world outside here that would like to take your children and destroy their lives? Did you realize there's a devil that's really alive? He's alive and well. Can you imagine pulling into your driveway? And somebody, be a terrorist being out in the corner of your driveway in the edge of the woods with a gun and the crosshairs on your wife and on your children. Did you realize a terrorist probably won't do that today? But the devil already has done that. And he wants to destroy your family and mine. How many agree with that? Say amen. There's a real live devil. And all of us have issues. And whenever a person gets down, it's amazing how the devil wants to come and stomp us on down and and push us on down further. And can I say to you today, I'm glad to report there's a God in heaven and a Savior that died on a cross that honestly, truly cares for you. There's times whenever I was a boy and my dad in the situation that he was in, growing up as a child, I didn't think anybody really cared I didn't think anybody really cared, but I sure am glad for the day that I heard that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really, really does care. And as I look at this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7, 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The E-T-H in that word means he cares continually. Buddy, I want to tell you, I'm glad whenever you're up, he cares. Whenever you're down, he cares. Whenever everything's going good, he cares. But he don't quit caring when things start going bad. He don't quit caring whenever you mess up. He don't quit caring just because you've got a past. He doesn't quit caring. He careth. He careth today, tomorrow, next year. He cares for you. Amen. Buddy, I want to tell you, I'm glad he does. There's a God in heaven that cares. He cares so much he bankrupted heaven to save you. He cares so much that he left the jasper walls and the gates of pearl and the praising of angels to come and die for you. He cares so much that he bankrupted himself to make you rich. He became poor so that you could become rich. He was hurt so that you wouldn't hurt for all of eternity. Buddy, I want to tell you, I'm glad he cares, amen. Do you know that God in heaven's the reason you have eyes that see today? The reason you have ears that hear today? Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. God gave you everything you have. He gave you a mind that can think. A body that is, if you're healthy today, He gave you the health of your body. He gave you ears that can hear and a heart that beats. He gave you a Bible. Hey, I'm glad to say God really does care. Amen. He really does care. He cares about you. He cares about me. Two opposing opposites. No matter where you fall in the spectrum, Jesus cares. Can I say this? We not only see two opposing opposites, two polar opposites, but we see trouble that's ongoing. Verse number 43, look at it closely. The woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physician. Neither could be healed of any. Look up here, listen. I see two opposing opposites. But I see trouble that is ongoing. Ongoing. Any of you ever walk into a dimly lit place? You know why they have bars dimly lit, don't you? Because they have cockroaches that come out. Amen. Can somebody say amen there? It's the dirtiest place in the whole world. Look here. Some restaurants are the same way. Some restaurants, they dim the light so you don't see the bugs. We was at a Chinese joint the other day. I'm not kidding. And my wife picked up one of the plates and there was a roach bug under it. I said, baby, it was smashed. I said, it's not alive. It ain't going to hurt you. She said, I'm not eating in this place with a roach bug in the plate. And I said, they tell me it's full of protein. You go to Thailand, man, you go to Thailand, you get chocolate-covered grasshoppers, amen. And chocolate-covered roach bugs probably wouldn't be too bad, but about anything you can put chocolate on, it's good, amen. (laughs) Well, what I'm trying to say is this. You have two, in this story, two opposite people. Then you have a problem that's ongoing. The world in which we live, you go in these restaurants, and they dim the lights. It's funny, whenever you go in, you can't hardly see It's like you've got to hunt your way back to the table. But after you're there, your eyes adjust to the room. And you can see just fine. Then you go back out in the sunlight and your eyes are blinking because you're not used to that much sunlight. And it takes your eyes a while to adjust. The same thing is true about the house of God. When you come in the house of God, sin is always wrong. Three amens in the house. The Bible says sin is an abomination unto God. Homosexuality is an abomination to God. The Bible said a false balance is an abomination to God. You know what that means? That means when something just gets out of balance, when it leans more to the ungodly than it is godly, God says, I don't like that. In other words, gentlemen, let's bring her right down to where we all live. 
God not only doesn't want you not to have sex with a woman that is not your wife, God doesn't want you looking at another woman in a sexual way that is not your wife because it's false balance. See? Young people, God not only does not want you going into sin and destroying your life into sin, God don't want the rock music and the country music that leads you into sin. Pretty good preaching right there. Somebody said, do you know anything about that? You bet you I know. I, I used to be a Hank Jr. listener. Tear in your beer, amen. And now I look back at all that and I thought, why did I want to be so stinking sad all the time? I mean, all country music, watch this, here's what it is. Grandma got run over by a train. I'm so sad, I could die. I'm so lonesome, I could die. Well, I want to tell you something. Whenever I got saved, for the first time I realized what real living is. And I don't have to get drunk on Friday night to have a good life. I don't hug the commode on Saturday morning puking in the commode. Thank God I'm more fun asleep than they do down at the bar room. Can somebody say amen? I first started living whenever I got saved. And so God not only doesn't want you stepping out on your wife, he doesn't want you looking at another woman sexually. God not only, look here, God not only doesn't want young people not to go out and destroy their life in sin, God doesn't want the things that lead you to sin. And so what I'm trying to say, whenever you come in the house of God and you hear the preacher and he's blistering on everything under the sun, he's preaching on everything, and you're thinking, good night, when's it ever going to end? May I remind you that the world outside looks at ungodliness like it's right and we live in that for one, two, three, four, five, six days and we come in the house of God and we wonder what in the world's wrong with our church. It could be that what's going on in your church ain't wrong but it's all right because God's word is always right. Amen. And whenever you come in here, it's like it takes a while to get adjusted back to extreme. I want to tell you something. Jesus is pretty extreme. He left heaven and conquered hell. He paid for every single sin you and I endure. And have ever done. He endured the punishment for it. Jesus is pretty extreme. He actually is the creator of the universe. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Listen to me. Jesus is creator God, and we don't comprehend Him in the glory that He is, but He's God in the flesh. And since he is, he's the one that made the lake of fire for people to go to that reject his plan of salvation. He made hell for people to go to later on the lake of fire. He's pretty extreme. I've either really got everybody's attention or I just killed the meeting. Now, which is it? If I've got your attention, say amen. Amen. Okay, good. We'll get back to it. I see two polar opposites. I see a trouble that's ongoing. Twelve years this woman's dealt with this problem. This man's tried his best to get to Jesus because he's got a 12-year-old daughter that's dying. Can you imagine this? Every second that ticks away, that man's daughter's getting closer to going into eternity. He ain't got time to waste. If there's anything that we get out of these verses right here, preacher, it grips my heart with the fact that there's no time to waste. Every step that Jairus took, he's thinking, man, I've got to get him back to my girl. I've got to get him back to my daughter. I've got to get him back home. Listen to me close. That woman, every step she took, she's bleeding to death. She's literally bleeding to death. It gives the idea of it has to be done now. Now. It has to be done now. Can I say this? If you're here today and you're unsaved, you know what I'd do? I'd run for the chance to get saved because Jesus is coming and the next event on God's calendar, He's taken every Christian off of this planet and according to the Word of God, those that are left on the planet, He shall send them strong delusion that they'd believe a lie and be damned. In other words, today's the day. You say, preacher, you're just trying to scare me. If that don't scare you, you need to check and see if you've got a pulse. Amen. 
The truth is there's a God in heaven that created the universe. Every man, woman, boy, and girl will stand before God. And we've all got issues. We've all got a past. Every one of us has got trouble. I mean, and Jesus can meet all of your needs. And God is the one that can fix all of your problems. But listen closely. We have trouble that's just prolonged. Prolonged. Twelve years the woman's waited until Jesus passed by. There's some of you. Listen, listen close. There's some of you that have done exactly what I've done before. You've got areas that you know, number one, you may be a Christian and you've got areas that needs to be cleaned up between you and God. You know God doesn't approve of. Look up here, give me eye contact just for a minute. I'm going to scan this entire service. There are people that I'm talking to right now. You're a person just like I'm a person. You may fight the same kind of battles that I fight. And you may have a different issue than me, but we're fighting a real live devil. And he wants to destroy your life. He wants to mess you up. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to make you look like you're a fake. He wants to take away the power of God out of your life. He doesn't want you to be a person of prayer. He doesn't want you to be a person that hungers after God. He wants to destroy the opportunity for you to be able to have children and be able to count for your kids and guide your family in the things of God. There's a real life devil that wants your testimony and mine. And if you're here today and you've got issues that you've been putting off, be reminded of this, that this verse teaches us we don't have time to play games with the things that God wants dealt with right now. You may be here and you may be lost. You may be here and you may be lost. You put it off. You know you need to get saved, you put it off. Can I tell you a story? A friend of mine, a friend of mine gave the gospel to a fellow oh, probably a year and a half ago. And the fellow just, you know, he said, listen, I don't need to hear your preaching. I don't need blah, blah, blah. And so he didn't want to talk to him. And a fellow happened to own a liquor store. A liquor store. And he's a pretty wealthy man. Long story short, the liquor store owner said, I'm just as close to God as you are. I know how all them people down there at church are. I know where all them hypocrites go. I see them come in here and buy their alcohol. And just because I sell alcohol, and he just went on this big tirade. Okay? And he said, I want to tell you something, preacher. I'm just as good as you are. Listen close. Now let me tell you something. First of all, I don't doubt that a bit. Because I'm not any better than anybody else on the face of planet Earth. You're looking at somebody that is a zero with the ring knocked off of it. Can somebody say amen there? Zero with five O's on the end. That's what I am. I know what I am. But that's okay. I know what you are too. All right? Trying to get you back going here now. I'm trying to get you back. Here we go. As the story goes on, the fellow said, I don't want to hear anything about that. I'm just as good as you are. Here's what happened. That fellow said, no church, no God, no Bible. I don't want anything to do with any of that stuff. And he went on with his liquor store business. And about six months after the fellow had witnessed to him, this guy's grandchild, grandchild, his only grandchild, got in a car accident where there was a drunk driver that hit their car head on. Killed that 14-year-old child. Killed the grandson. Grandpa comes to the hospital. He's weeping and crying. He goes all the way through the situation of burying his only grandchild, weeping and crying. And he's hearing in his mind that that preacher saying, you need to get saved. And the, and the man said, I can't get out of this business. I make a lot of money in this business. He said, but you need to get saved more than you need this business. And he's saying, I want to tell you something, friend. God wants you to get saved today. And the man wouldn't because he's holding on to his business. Time passes by. His grandson gets killed, 14, 12, 14 years old. Grandson gets killed in a terrible car accident, hit by a drunk driver. There's an investigation that went on with the drunk driver that hit the man's son. And the investigation revealed six months after that that the alcohol that the man was drinking was bought at the very grandpa's store that refused God months earlier. It was bought by grandpa's store 
in Grandpa's store. And truth is that Grandpa's just as guilty of his child's death as the drunk driver that hit the child. I got two amens there. That grandpa is just as guilty. We're in a time right now when nobody wants to accept guilt about anything. But the truth is we've all got issues. But your issue can be fixed with Jesus Christ. And you and I have to face up the reality of the fact that you and I are guilty of some things that cause sometimes harm to others. And God can help you with your issue just like he did mine. Long story short, that grandpa started weeping. And he sold that business for nothing. He got out of that business. <laughs> he said, I want these days whenever I can get to heaven. I know that boy got saved before he died. I remember that boy getting saved, trying to get me to come to church. And the first thing I will say one day when I see him, because the man ended up getting saved after the grandchild died. He said, the first thing I want to say is, son, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was ever in that business. He should have cleared up his issue before it became ongoing because an ongoing issue will affect the lives of people around you and it may take some of the very family members that you love to get you straightened out with God. Issues that are ongoing. Twelve years, twelve-year-old child, two polar opposite people, but Jesus is helping them. Let me ask you, which area does your heart fall? Which area does your heart fall? Is your heart hard, hardened, stony, rocky ground, thorny ground? What will you do with the Word of God given today? I'm going to close there. I'm going to ask the pianist to come. We're all going to stand. Would you stand with us? I believe God would have us in there.